Welcome to the Real Estate Espresso Podcast, your morning shot of what's new in the world of real estate investing. I'm your host, Victor Menashe. On today's show, we're going back to the year 1910. These were the origins of the formation of the Federal Reserve during a secretive meeting on Jekyll Island off the coast of Georgia. Leading up to those fateful meetings that took place over nine days, there had been a series of runs on banks and financial panics back in 1873, in 1884, in 1893, and then in 1907. These banking panics over the preceding decades had caused the outright failure of no less than 1,748 banks. The Federal Reserve Act of 1913 was a direct outcome of this clandestine meeting on Jekyll Island. The Federal Reserve was created to protect the banking system. It's owned by the member banks, not the U.S. government. The Federal Reserve banks that make up the Fed are not banks either in the traditional sense. It's neither federal, nor does it have any reserves, and nor is it a bank. Now, I've been thinking long and hard about whether the Federal Reserve has been mistaken in their interest rate policy. After all, think about it. It's a bold statement for some podcaster located in Canada to declare in unequivocal terms that the Federal Reserve, with its hundreds of PhDs, is utterly and completely incompetent. But here we go. All it takes is a few minutes of the most basic internet research to realize that the banking system in the United States is backed into a corner from which it's virtually impossible to see a way out. That is, unless the Federal Reserve makes a choice between raising interest rates to fight inflation or lowering interest rates to save the banking system. I'm completely convinced that this is the choice facing the Federal Reserve. Irrespective of their statements to the contrary, the outlook is not rosy. The economy is not strong, and the banking system is not resilient. We have a spread of more than 400 basis points between the yield available in short-term T-bills versus the interest available in deposit at the bank, any bank. This will result in a flight of capital from the banking system, in general, to monetary instruments like T-bills that are safe. The only way to stem the tide of cash in the banking system would be to reduce or eliminate that spread in yield between treasuries and the bank deposits. And so far, the Fed has refused to lower their interest rates. After all, they want to get inflation down to the target 2%. So let's examine the other possibility. What's the possibility of the banks raising their interest rate that they offer to depositors? We're going to look at several mid-sized banks across the United States and see how much headroom they have to raise interest rates to depositors before they completely wipe out all of the profits from their income statement. We're going to start with Citizens Bank, a medium-sized bank approximately the size of Silicon Valley Bank. They're well-managed, and they were actually our lender for a project on Ingersoll Street in Philadelphia. Citizens Bank currently has $186 billion in deposits on their balance sheet. The company earned $685 million in net income in the fourth quarter of 2022. They have not yet announced their financial results of the first quarter of 2023, so we're going to use the data from the most recent reporting period, which is three months old. So the question is, how much would the bank need to raise interest rates to depositors before completely wiping out any profit? And can the bank, in fact, afford to raise the interest rate to depositors at all? If Citizens Bank were to increase the interest rate to depositors by 1.5%, which is still a long way away from the yield spread to UST bills, that would equate to an additional $680 million of interest expense on the company's income statement. That would leave the company with only $5 million in net profit at the end of each quarter. Even raising the interest rate by 1.5% will not be enough to stem the flow of capital out of the banking system, and it would bankrupt the company from a cash flow perspective. At this point, Citizens Bank is backed into a corner and unable to write new loans for fear they might experience even larger capital outflows and eventually face a cash crunch. They need to write new loans at higher interest rates in order to increase profitability, but they lack the flexibility to do so. They need to raise interest rates to depositors to stem the flight of capital, but they also lack the flexibility to do that either. They are truly backed into a corner with no obvious way out. The irony in all of this is that the Federal Reserve was created specifically to protect the banking system from the turmoil that was witnessed in the early 1900s and in the late 1800s. In those days, a run on the bank was was frightening and depositors lost their life savings unless they had some of it stashed away in a shoebox at home or under their mattress. So here we are in 2023 with the Federal Reserve 
effectively having been the unwitting architect of the demise of the U.S. banking system. What's even more shocking is that they couldn't even see it coming, and they continue to deny it despite the fact that the evidence is overwhelmingly clear. I've spent the better part of a day before recording this episode merely reflecting on the magnitude of this realization, and I'm asking myself questions like, what am I missing? Gosh, I hope I'm wrong. Could there be another explanation? But the more I look at it, the clearer the picture is that the Fed has created a set of conditions that are untenable for the member banks. Let's look at a few more banks, just in case Citizens Bank is an isolated case. And I happen to stumble upon the one bank that had a weak profitability proposition. So let's look at a smaller bank. Look, let's look at Atlantic Union Bank. They have $15.9 billion in deposits, and they earned $67.6 million in profit in Q4. If they increased their interest rate to depositors by 1.5%, they would wipe out all their profits. And it's a similar story to Citizens Bank. 1.5% increase in the rate offered to depositors is enough to wipe out all their profits. Let's look at one more. How about Comerica Bank? They had $71.4 billion in deposits in Q4 of last year. That's down, by the way, by $13 billion from a year earlier. But again, in the case of Comerica, an interest rate increase offered on deposit accounts by 2% would be enough to wipe out all of the earnings of the bank. Comerica is the strongest of the banks that we've looked at in this respect but still not enough to move the needle and to stop the outflow of capital from the bank. We've witnessed $13 billion leave the bank in the last year. The only solution, and I'm going to say again, the only solution, is for the Fed to lower interest rates and to reduce that spread. They have backed their member financial institutions into a corner from which there is no escape. As you think about that, have an awesome rest of your day. Go make some great things happen. We'll talk to you again tomorrow. <laughs>